and uh, industry. Hi, everybody. I have a story for you. Um, can you turn the mic up a little bit in the back, please? Thank you. So at Galois, we at Galois a while back, we wrote a significantly sized code base independently typed Haskell. Right? So a few years ago, if you came to ICFP and you said, hey, hey, we, we, wrote, a, we wrote a thing in Haskell, and it's big, and it's fast, and it works, that was, people cared, right? They listened. But now that's old hat. People do it all the time. It happens everywhere. But independently typed Haskell, that is still something a little bit, a little bit at the edge. And it, it was pretty hard to do this. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Oh, yeah. It, it, it's pretty hard to do this. Um, I, I think uh, you'll, you'll see as we go on that it wasn't the easiest thing that anyone's ever done. But in the end, it worked. You can go download it, play with it, run it, and have fun with it if you want. So what did we make? We made a system called Crucible. Crucible is a framework for writing uh, symbolic executors. So it's, it's, uh, you might take some LLVM intermediate representation, say you compile a C program with Clang, and then it'll take it in, it'll crunch through it, and at the end of the day, it'll spit out a, well, maybe even at the end of the minute, it'll spit out a pure functional model of everything that that program does if the termination behavior of the program is obvious enough for this technique to make sense. It may also just sit there a while until you get bored. And great, but it also has to read Java bytecode. Um, and, and it has to read x86 machine code. And it has to read MATLAB code. <laughs> and and it, it works with Julia. And we have ongoing work to make it support one of the intermediate representations in Rust, because that'll give us LLVM, but sometimes it's nicer to work at a higher level. And Crucible really maps all of these into a common intermediate representation with language-specific extensions. So in the case of LLVM, it'll be the memory model. In the case of something like MATLAB or Julia, it'll be the primitives available in those languages, but not in, say, x86 machine code, um, and so forth. And why do we want this pure functional model of what these imperative programs do? Well, it's because that's what solvers understand. So we can kick it over and start reasoning about it somewhere else. So in order to make something like this work, we really need it to be correct. Like, we're, we're, we're saying that we're going to do some verification, so we'd better not have silly bugs that let us, where we look and we say, well, is this, is this model actually a model of the program? And it's got to go fast, because symbolic execution is a highly difficult process. Right? Like, you've got to, you know, if you branch on a symbolic value, you've got to explore both of the paths. And this can take a long time. And we'd like it to take as little time as possible. It's also got to be extensible. As you saw, we have lots of new languages coming in. And writing a whole uh, symbolic execution tool for each one of them would not be as feasible. And then finally, we've got to be able to maintain it. Crucible is used by a lot of projects at Galois, and all of them have their own individual needs, and we need to be able to adapt it and modify it, make it work, keep adapting to the churn of libraries, those kind of things. And so just for a little bit of history, we actually did used to write individual symbolic simulators. So from 2009 to 2011, there was uh, one for the JVM. And 2011, one for LLVM. So Crucible kind of emerged from these with this uh, intermediate representation as sort of a generalization of them, building on some lessons we learned. And then you say, well, this is all great, but why did you write it in fancy typed dependent Haskell stuff? And, and really, initially, if we're, if, if we're being honest, it was, it was for fun. <laughs> um, but, but it actually worked out and, and, and kept going. And we, we did not abandon it in fear. <laughs> so how, how does it work? In, in Haskell's, uh, we, we use Haskell types to ensure things like all crucible expressions being both well-typed and well-scoped. We use it to ensure that our control flow graphs, control flow graphs are well-formed. You know, we're not jumping to non-existent places. Um, we're keeping track of which language is being simulated so that you don't use your x86 primitives in your JVM simulator. And also, when you implement these primitives, the runtime values also track their types, so you can't you know, try to add two closures together, for instance. And, you know, we've managed to encode most of what we want to encode, with a couple exceptions. We don't quite have a representation of universal types. You know, we can write polymorphic things, but not for all. And we don't yet have a representation of telescopes that works the way we want. So, no symbolic simulators for dependently typed things yet. <laughs> so what does this look like? Well, we start off with a data kind. It says data there, but it's actually meant to give us a kind full of types. And so crucible types are things like booleans, integers, 
bit vectors parameterized by their width um function handles so the function handle has two arguments here one of them is this context of crucible types a context is basically a type level snark list of types and this is because contracts grow on the right and then we also have ah the return type of the function and then in order to bridge the gap between compile time and runtime we have runtime representatives similar to what the singletons library will get you you know so a representative of a type level natural number is a runtime natural number that encodes their connection um and so we also make representatives for all of our types and there's lots and lots of constructors on this data type hence the suggestive dot 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 we have for example a representative of the boolean type which we can see is a type wrapper of bool type and we have a representative of bit vector types where it takes some evidence that the bit vector is not empty because solvers don't typically like zero length bit vectors and you know the then we have a runtime representative of its actual width so we can branch on it if we need to um i'm going to put that off to the side for now and show you our expressions so expressions are indexed over the crucible types of the represented expression and rather than using haskell's built-in notion of fixed points or recursive data types we coded it up in an open recursive style because that gives us some nice flexibility so it has another argument which says how do we figure out what goes in each sub expression based on what type can fit there so that's what this expr is for so a boolean literal for instance that takes a, a boolean and then it's got a boolean type and takes two sub expressions whatever those happen to be each of which have a boolean type and gives us back a boolean type um less than or equal to on integers takes two integer expressions and gives us back a bool bit vector literals take some evidence that the bit vector is of non zero width and then they take the actual width and then they take an integer and this integer is the underlying bits that we're representing um and it's got a type of the appropriate width and then addition on bit vectors that takes two bit vectors of the same non zero width and then gives us back something of the same width because we're going to you know wrap around up at the top so this open recursive style is actually very very useful in a project like crucible so for instance we have a higher level representation where if you actually want to construct these things it it's sometimes difficult to just sit down and make one so we we give you a, a notion of expression here which is where the fixed point goes through uh some type so we get we can either sort of continue going on down or we can have an individual sort of atom which is a thing that we've already evaluated and then later on once we convert it into a kind of ssa representation then we have an expression which is parameterized over all of the available ssa registers that's this context inside of the expression and then the type that it'll give us back and then we apply app only to existing ssa registers and that way we can bake our invariant into the type without having to copy paste all of those hundreds of constructors one of the best benefits of fancy types is that it lets us kill bugs dead um i think you've you've heard that a few times i decided to make it somewhat graphic and unpleasant here uh <laughs> let, let let's hide that away so so but not only does it help us squish bugs um as as you might expect it also forces us to think deeply before we start writing um this this was said to me once during an oral exam and uh it stuck it stuck with me <laughs> um um one of the biggest benefits though is it lets us refactor essentially fearlessly if we want to make a change to the code base we we make the change and then we kind of do what ghc says until it's done and that that really helps a lot <laughs> and and then finally it uh at the borders between the very typed code and the only somewhat typed code the certain times sometimes we'll need to do a runtime check and the type system imposes that runtime check on us in other words if we forget to check that the thing is actually of a non zero width then the compiler will tell us that and we don't have to remember it and this helps avoid a lot of bugs sort of at the edges so big benefits but there are some costs one of them is performance um like i said earlier crucible needs to go fast so taking a look at that type level snark list context we also have a runtime thing which is called an assignment an assignment takes some family indexed by the kind of whatever is inside of the of the context and then it also takes a context and it assigns sort of at each position something with that family instantiated at the appropriate pointwise element and this lets us do things like have a safe notion of an index into an assignment 
and then a lookup operator and note the, note the lack of, of maybe or either or exception at the right hand side because we know it's there and we can just go get it. So if, if we're going to sit down and do this in my, you know, let's, I, I'm sitting down, I'm going to learn Agda, I've read a tutorial, I'll make a data structure that looks like this, right? We've got an empty assignment, which is an assignment to the empty context, and we have a way to extend it on the right with something of the corresponding type. However, once you scale up to bigger problems, this approach is just not going to work. Um, linked lists are just not a good choice of a data structure when we've got a lot of stuff in them. So instead, we kick that out and replace it with a binary tree, and, or with a balanced tree, and then we, have, uh, we use unsafe coerce to go and get the right things out. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, we now have two implementations. We have one which the type checker accepts, where everything works, and then we have one where we work really hard to get it right, and we can use the slow one, the slow secure one, as a test oracle for the fast, hopefully secure one. And that, that approach has tended to work pretty well. Another issue that we have is that sometimes we need to care about equality proofs. So in, in base these days in GHC, we've got this propositional equality data type. So this is a witness that two things are equal. And then we have a standard way of going to recover some of this evidence based on one of these runtime representatives. That's this test equality. So their F might be something like nat repper or type repper. And once we've tested this equality, then it may, if we're lucky, return some evidence that the two types that we have representative of are in fact the same type. Um, unfortunately, this requires that we end up doing quite a lot of recursion and testing. What we really want to do is like, these things come from the same place, let's just do a pointer equality test. Um, Haskell, for very good reasons, doesn't let you do pointer equality tests. So instead, we fake it. There's a data type called nonce. So a nonce starts off with a, a sort of a brand or a type level, a type parameter, which lets us not confuse our gensim counters with one another. And it uh, has the type that it is a nonce that it represents. And then once we've gone and compared two nonces, we know that they are coming from the same tree. And then we can just unsafe coerce when we have to. Um, and you know, you might say, well, this is a 64-bit int, your, your counter. Like, what happens when it wraps around? Well, on, on a modern chip, you've got about a century before a 64-bit value wraps around, and I don't want to wait that long for my execution. Um, so, so really, the, the, the way that we've needed to attack this problem is to start off with safe code that the compiler accepts, that the type checker says, yes, you're good to go. Um, then we, we use profiler a lot. And once we profiled it, we can figure out why is it taking longer than we want it to take. And we can sit there and think and, and, and re-implement things using up-to-date data structures. Um, then we can test it, right? And now we're back to code that we at least have good reason to believe is still safe. And then we repeat it, and then we repeat it, and, and hey, it goes fast enough. Another difficulty that we've encountered has been writing proofs in Haskell, because as, as, as much as it would like to be one, Haskell is not yet a, a wonderful proof assistant. So, Come on, please. <laughs> so, um, so for, for example, if we want to prove that if x is strictly greater than, one, than 0 and y is uh, strictly greater than x, then y is also strictly greater than 0. First off, we have to write it this way, which you have to look at a little bit to figure out. And then what we can do is we can appeal to the GHC constraint solver to get, some, to get a proof that, x is, is, uh, that 1 is less than or equal to x, I should say. We can combine that using transitivity and the fact that uh, x is, that anything is less than or equal to 1 plus itself. And that gives us another step that x is less than or equal to x plus 1. And we can take another step and then we can see that uh, y is also going to be greater than or equal to x plus 1 by appealing once again to the constraint solver. And you know, by transitivity we can stick this together and get that y is strictly greater than 0. Haskell programmers looking at this often think, why would you ever want to write that program? Whereas people who are used to more traditional dependently typed languages might look at it and say, why would you want to write it that way? <laughs> um, so it, it, it takes a little bit of training to figure it out. The, the other issue that, uh, that you have when you're 
when you're not a PhD student anymore, is sometimes you need to find people who you can pay to do work for you. And so we've, we've been able to, like we're lucky at Galois that we have a lot of people who already are very good at Haskell and type theory and verification and mathematics and all these things. We have a, a great group of people to recruit from internally for the project. Um, we found that we can really recruit from two groups of people. The first are those with experience in dependent types. So I, I came in having not much experience with the Bennett Haskell and a fair bit of experience in Idris. And my experience starting to work on Crucible was that I'd write Idris code in my head and then sort of hand compile it into Haskell. And, and, and that way of thinking about it let me get started pretty quick um, once I've sort of learned the idioms and the encodings. And the other thing, the other group of people are those who are just really good at Haskell already, and they need to, you know, learn these exactly how GADT pattern matching works and things like that. And eventually, we can get them up to speed. But we need a lot of training and mentoring, no matter where they're coming from, and that is a cost that we have. So, if you want to read our experience report, if if this sounds tantalizing, adventurous, and fun, then you can also read about our sort of extra standard library for doing this style of programming called Parameterized Utils. Um, this is separate from Crucible, and you can download it and use it in your projects. Um, also about how we interface with libraries that have fewer types, and also about some of the challenges we've had with tooling along the way, because yeah, tooling is very important, and we push it hard. So just in summary, uh, dependently typed Haskell in a big project, it really can help catch bugs. Um, it really does help you refactor fearlessly. Like the things that people say are the theoretical benefits of this, like they work, they exist. Also, it's quite a lot of fun. Um, on the other hand, you may encounter some performance difficulties, and you have to be prepared to make the occasional compromise in order to account for those. And then also, there, you're, you're likely to have tooling and training challenges, at least for now. So if you'd like to download and play with Crucible or with parameterized utils, you can find them at those addresses. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? Yes, we have time for questions. Um, you were four seconds before. Four seconds! So, you can tell he's working in industry, he takes care of deadlines. Um, okay, I'll drop it. So we'll start with one on, online. Um, how, do you well, how do you handle well scoping in the app type family? The well scopedness property, how do you express that in your. Um, the, the well scopedness, we get that by parameterizing. So, so I, I didn't show you the entire expression type. And we also keep track of the variable context, and then which is one of which is going to be one of those assignments. And then we have the index that I showed you earlier on top of the variable constructor. So it looks a lot like the way you do it in something like Agda. Cool. Um, Phil, that was a great talk. Thank you. Why Thank didn't you. you mention my favorite programming language, Agda? Um, I just did mention Agda. <laughs> um, also, if you. Uh, Oh, I forgot Agda on this slide. <laughs> um, I, I think Agda is a wonderful language, and it, it, there's a lot of them out there. So, but specifically, right, Agda compiles to Haskell. Ah, OK. Why didn't so we write did this in Agda? I see. <laughs> OK. Um, so there's a lot of challenges that occur when you're starting to use other smaller languages. One issue is that we might end up being compiler maintainers if we use a, a, a very small language like Agda as opposed to a fairly small one like Haskell. Um, another another issue is that because we rely on the profiler so much, we need to have a reasonable connection between the cost sites identified in profiling and the source code of the program, and that is obscured when you compile a higher level language through Haskell. Um, and generally, library. Oh, I love you calling Haskell low level. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. We have. Um... Oh. All right. Uh, before oh. I hand it back, yeah. I'm giving an Agda tutorial on Friday. I Wonderful. want to advertise that to this group. Agda is a great language. You all should go learn it. So this might be also the, the answer to the next question, because as a grumpy customer on, online complaining, we are the dependent types. So I think that the questioner is probably trying to make a point about Haskell not being a strictly speaking a dependently type language. And that's because you end up essentially faking things by copying them across. and such as life. We can use it like one, and we it, 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 we actually had a bit of a discussion as to whether or not we would call it that, and I, I think we're, we can call it that, but if, if you want to quibble about terminology, please find me in the break. I like doing that. <laughs> All right, so we have one last question while the next speaker sets up. And it's um, over there. 
so you mentioned that writing proofs ah with ah gedt matching is very hard have you thought writing a tactic language for haskell i don't think we've thought about writing a tactic language for haskell per se there is a type checker plugins mechanism that yavor made a while back and that can be used to implement these things but typically that ends up with really subtle soundness issues that can come up and bite you and there's more discussion of that in the experience report okay thank you um thanks bob